Virginia. Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't been here before, today we're talking grey books. Weird. Not if you've watched the rest of my Rainbow Bookshelf tour. Yes, I have gone through my extensive list of books and showed you them all, literally every single one. If that doesn't sound fun to you, I get it. I get it. Fine. Fair enough. If that does sound fun to you, I have a whole playlist up there. But stay here right now because I'm about to show you my grey shelf. We've done red, we've done yellow, we've done orange, we've done... What are the other colours in the rainbow? <laughs> We've done most of them essentially, but today we're doing grey. And I think I have considerably more than Christian. So I started this series um, a long time ago and I've been adding to it just kind of as things have been going on, but it's become even more like relevant, I think, during this weird time of coronavirus where everything is shut down um, because I so miss just browsing shelves and randomly coming across books. Um, so I guess this series has started to act kind of um, for me and hopefully for you as a kind of way of browsing bookshelves and, and rediscovering old stuff that I love. Hopefully you'll be able to discover stuff that you kind of stumble upon because I feel like stumbling upon is now something that is just so hard to do with the bookshops closed. Uh, and again, I'd reiterate that if you love any of these books and you do want to buy them, please try and order them from an independent bookshop because right now I'm panicking that there won't be any for me to browse when the world does open up. So I've left some links to um, the hashtag choose bookshops and different ways that you can support bookshops and order from them wherever you are in the world. As with every episode, I'm going to show you the whole bookshelf in its entirety. And then I have pulled off some special ones to chat to you about after the tour. Hello, we're back again um, in the Rainbow Bookshelf realm and we are going to grey. I think grey books are underappreciated in the bookstagram visually demanding world. I love a grey book. It feels like kind of warmer and less self-helpy than a white, but less serious and formal than a black book. Um, so these are my grey books. Let's go. <laughs> this is a... What? What are you doing here? Virginia, know your place. Jeez, classic feminists really, really do take up space. Okay, starting over here, we've got Vicky Fever's I Want, I Want. I really like Vicky Fever as a poet. I think she's really cool. Um, this is a beautiful copy of Dracula by Bram Stoker. I think I've shown this before on the channel, uh, but these are the word cloud classics. They're stunning if you ever get your hands on them. And then inside, Oh my god. This is a Persephone book, War Notes. It's actually the only Persephone book I own, but they publish all their books grey and then all of their inner pages express what the book's like, like and about, so that's pretty cool. It's Gone Dark over Bill's Mothers. This cover is bloody stunning. I just, what the hell? The Hourglass Factory by Lucy Ribchester. The Islamist by Ed Hussein. This has fully snuck in, but I regret nothing. This is Shakespeare Retold <laughs> DVD. I'm gonna make a really bold statement here and really insult some other kind of adapt. Ad but I truly believe that the BBC Shakespeare Retold series from the 90s, no, early 2000s, is the best adaptations of Shakespeare ever. Johnny Vegas, James McAvoy, Billy Piper, what is not to like? Jeez. Anybody who doesn't like these is unpleasable as a person. <laughs> Just saying. The Reader by Paul Fennell. How Not to Speak of God by Peter Rowlands. I, this is on loan from a, fr a dear friend, James. And if you're watching this, I am so sorry. I will give this back to you next time I see you. I've had this for years. <laughs> One of Craig's books, Get the Photos Others Can't. And he does, check his Instagram, it's great. See What I Have Done by Sarah Schmidt. I want this font in my life, in my brain, in my soul. I want to be able to write in this font. Recollections of my non-existence, again, without the dust jacket, just because I thought it would look nicer. Look at this grain. I absolutely melt at like that kind of grain. I don't know what that is, but like, it's like salt and pepper kind of gray. Oh, I love it. Max Porter, Lanny, a classic. I say a classic, I still haven't read it. <laughs> Maeve Brennan, The Visitor. George the Poet, Search Party. Oh my God, we need to talk about this. There's so many to talk about on this one. Oh, I don't even know where to start. The Novel Cure, an A to Z of Literary Remedies. This is a book where you can look up what your ailment is and it will prescribe you a book. Anything from divorce to facing your demons to childbirth, cancer, burning your dinner, broken promises, boredom, bad back. What the hell? This is Feral by George Monbiot. It's one of my favorite non-fiction books ever. Let's talk about that too. Why not? How to Be a Woman by Catelyn Moran. She by H. Ryder Haggard. This is a classically problematic book that has a beautiful cover and is very interesting to talk about when we're trying to <coughs> deconstruct what we thought was okay with literature. So it's definitely one I probably want to include in a video essay in the future. But um, if you went to uni in the UK, you probably studied this at some point. Uh, another Sarah Knight book, you'll see these peppering my shelves. This one is You Do You, Be Who You Are, because you've got to get what you want. <laughs> 
<laughs> she says that how it is. I have been in East London for 86 and a half years. Oh my God, we have to talk about this. How to Age uh, by Anne Camp. I haven't read this yet, but like I'm waiting till I age. Don't at me. <laughs> a History of Capitalism according, according to the Jubilee line. The best cover ever, no. Man Up by Jack Irwin. The Art of Sleeping Alone by Sophie Fontelle. Information is beautiful, which is literally information presented in really beautiful infographic kind of ways. I can't really show you, but maybe I'll show you on screen somewhere. <laughs> I'm not really sure why I have this, but it kind of fascinates me and I have read through it or read through bits of it a little bit and I kind of really like it, but it's called The Advertising Concept Book. <laughs> a complete guide to creative ideas, strategy and campaigns. And uh, it helped me professionally and personally in the bits that I have read, which is very little, but I don't know why I have this, but I love it. I actually, it's too heavy to get down from the shelf, so please excuse me while I leave it there. And finally, as if you didn't know I was cool already, The Sound of Music Family Scrapbook. This is a fan book, so you can read all about how they made The Sound of Music and all of the backstage bits and uh, pieces of paper. I'm very cool. That's all you need to know. It even comes with a DVD of their home movies that they made while they were making it. Cool, cool, cool. And that's everything on the grey shelf. Let's go. So there you go. You've seen the innards of my grey shelves. I feel exposed. But here are three that I pulled off to chat to you about. The first one is George Monbiot's Feral. I personally think they've done it a disservice with the paperback cover. This is the hardback and it's bloody beautiful. I remember seeing this in the shop and being really drawn in by the deer in this like car park situation. If you've been to my channel before you know how in love with kind of like lyrical non-fiction I am. That kind of borders on autobiography but is rooted in science and George Monbiot does that so well. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with George Monbiot's work he is a British journalist that talks a lot about climate and the environment and this is a book I picked up like maybe seven years ago. I'd really like to reread it. Um, this is the original subtitle and I think it explains the book a lot better than the current subtitle, Searching for Enchantment on the Frontiers of Rewilding. Um, so this is a book all about as British people our engagement with the environment and our disjointed relationship with it. Rewilding is this idea of um, radical environment which isn't really that radical it's kind of just how it started in that we as societies integrate more with our environment live in a more sustainable wild way. What I really like about this book is that he kind of weaves in mythology and British fairy tales into our how we feel about our environment now and he talks a lot about wolves how they're actually completely harmless but because of all the allegories and Little Red Riding Hood rhetoric around a wolf. That's had a direct impact on the population of wolves in the UK and how tragic that is and how they're really quite essential to our ecosystems. How that perhaps when we're scared of the wolf at our door, it's actually the kind of wildness in ourselves. So it has that kind of lyrical element to it as well as having loads of facts and being rooted in uh, ed evidence from experts. He actually tracks down a lot of experts in this. Uh, experts that are trying to bring, bring back wolves, lynxes, grey whales. Before I read this book I thought about the British landscape as quite tame, diluted, beige compared to a lot of kind of like other countries environments but actually I think originally the British wilderness was a lot more exciting. I also remember reading this and having my mind kind of blown by this idea of um, fields. So when we look at like British fields or we go to like the Lake District or the Peak District we look over these beautiful farmlands and we go oh it's so beautiful. Um, he actually argues that we've kind of been conditioned to look that way and if we'd known the wild before the farmlands and before the Industrial Revolution, we'd have been looking out at what we would see as a tragic landscape, stripped of its trees, stripped of its nutrients, stripped of its variations. And I, and I guess like warning, it did kind of ruin a lot of like postcard views for me. But it's a really hopeful book and it gave me lots to be excited about, about um, maybe the future and how we can rework the, the wild into our cities. It's really grounded in realistic policy changes and how like rewilding won't be boring or rubbish, it'll actually be really cool for every Everybody involved. So if you're looking for a book that's really beautifully written and a little peek into the environment and apathy and how we change that then I'd really recommend this. It's obviously not a perfect overview, it doesn't encapsulate everything about the rewilding um, field if you will, you won't, neither will I. I really respect George Monbiot as a journalist and as a writer and I think this is an incredible book. This is Search Party by George the Poet. George the Poet is also a musician as well as a poet uh, and he also has an incredible podcast that you if you love like kind of really tightly edited narrative music kind of soundscape 
podcast, kind of like maybe Dolly Parton's America, then you will absolutely bloody love this. It's won loads of awards. It's incredible. George the Poet grew up in Northwest London uh, and he went on to go to Cambridge and he talks about the kind of juxtapositions between those two environments and how disconnected Britain is with its class system. And he's been compared to um, John Cooper Clark or Benjamin Zephaniah. This is a collection I've had for a really long time. I got it when I went to a performance that he did. Must have been like five years ago now, but it was like bloody incredible. He's an incredible performer. So if you want to get a taste of his work, maybe, maybe look him up on YouTube. But I'll probably always keep this book because it's just such a great thing to dip into and a great example of like, hopefully where British poetry is going because I love it. And then lastly, um, I've lived in East London for 86 and a half years. I have to, I almost cry every time I look at this book. That's why I have to keep it spying out. <laughs> um, this is um, published by Hoxton Mini Press, who are a really interesting um, independent British publisher. Kind of their manifesto is to make photography books more accessible because photography books tend to be incredibly expensive and with good reason, like it is really expensive to print photography books and they often sell very few units. But most of Hoxton Mini Press's books are beautifully produced, really small, which again makes them more affordable and usually around like 13 to 15 pounds, which is a lot cheaper than most photography books. This is one of the first ones they ever published and it's actually, uh, all the photos are done by one of the guys that runs the press and he got to know this guy called Joe and there's a really beautiful preface to this. Uh, he talks about how he was hanging out in Hoxton Square and he says, what began as a selfish impulse, I wanted to photograph him in the hopes of winning some award, turned into a project that has left a lasting mark on my life. I never planned to be friends with jo Joseph Markovich, but as John Lennon might have said, friendship happens when you are busy making other plans. I assumed Joe was lost or homeless or possibly a little mad. I assumed he might have alcohol in his bag. I was wrong on all accounts. It turned out that he, more than any of us young pretenders, was rooted in this area and was much more sane than all of us. For 80 years, Joe has witnessed a continual cultural transformation we could only imagine. Where he knew cabinet makers, he knew cocktail bars, where he frequented music halls, he walked past modern estates. I planned to make a book about the history of this rich and diverse area. Joe, however, wanted to talk about action movies, cool Sc tall Scandinavian women, Nicolas Cage, the guitar congesting his chest and te how technology has blown up the world. Joe has never once left England and rarely London, but his vibrant imagination, aided by books from various Hackney libraries, has enabled him to travel. So it's kind of about like his friendship with Joe and his kind of naive idea of like impressing this idea of what an old person in East London might have known or experienced. And he kind of just lets Joe talk through the book. So it's just beautiful portraits of Joe and quotes of things he's said about the world and things that he's been through. Uh, he used to make kind of suitcases in East London and he talks about like how how East London has changed around him and how he kind of thinks that's for the better but it is very different from how it was and it's a really beautiful compassionate look at um, the old people in our communities and how they can go um, unnoticed and it's just such a hopeful little gem of a photography book. That's it, that's the tweet, that's the video. Those are all my grey books. Um, if you'd like to watch more booktube videos you can click here. If you'd like to watch more of the Rainbow Bookshelf tour and see what's on my other shelves, ooh, you can click here. Thank you as always to the Gumption Club for making these videos possible and until next time, Fog Snog out.